Hi, welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. This is your host, Edward Russell, and I'm joined by my colleague, Jay Shabbat, as we talk about the JetBlue Spirit merger and airline earnings in the June quarter and Southwest's uh, secret weapon. Thank you and enjoy. Good morning, Jay. How are you doing today? Good morning, Ned. How are you? Doing well, doing well. It's We've had a, a nice little hiatus from the Airline Weekly Lounge. I was on vacation, and, and you were in the middle of merger and earnings uh, extra, <laughs> extravaganza, it seems. Yeah, yeah. It was quite busy while you were gone, Ned. We uh, had a big, big merger, as you know, and uh, the, the some, some resolution to that JetBlue uh, spirit drama and Frontier, of course, involved in that as well. It came out the losing end. And uh, yeah, and then just uh, it's 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 earning season, so uh, we're we're in the thick of that, for sure. Well, let's start out talking about sort of the the big merger machinations here in the U.S. and then what's happening there. We'll get to earnings later, but it, like you you mentioned briefly, uh, JetBlue has come out the victor in the the sort of the bidding war between Frontier and JetBlue for Spirit Airlines. You know, this is you know. It's it's a big deal that they've agreed to merge yet, but they're they're far from done. I mean, tell you know you you were you covered it, Jay. Tell us more. Sure. Yeah. So so there's still some uh, formalities to uh, you know some some eyes <laughs> eyes to dot t's to cross so to speak, uh, including you know the spirit uh, shareholders have to approve it. Um, that's that's probably more of a formality. So the big the big question mark, the big uncertainty that that still lingers here is whether or not the U.S. government, the competition authorities in Washington. Will approve this, and there's uh, there's a good case to be made that they might not, or they might do so, but with strings attached, um, strings that maybe JetBlue wouldn't be willing to stomach, and uh, that is that's going to be playing out. You know, that's not something we'll know. You know, next week or next month, that's going to be playing out perhaps over the next year. And it's interesting that JetBlue doesn't think that uh, it can really close this deal um, until I mean they they mentioned it, it may even go on into 2024. So yeah, uh, there's, yeah there, there's uncertainty there. Um, yeah, speaking of that regular, so regulatory situation. So on Tuesday, Jeff Blue presented their, their June quarter results. And, you know, they were asked about the merger, unsurprisingly. And it was, uh, you know, I was surprised because I, you know, they said exactly what you said. They, they don't, they're not anticipating regulatory approval until end of 2023, which is a or at least deal close uh, at the end of 2023, which is a, a ridiculously long time. I, there was a note out from Jamie Baker at J.P. Morgan. You know, American and U.S. Airways took six months for the DOJ to respond and another three months to settle. So that's nine months. Alaska Virgin America, he said it was five months and then two months to settle. So we're talking about seven months. But, you know, cl- merger close at the end of 2023 seems ridiculously long. We're, we're 18. No. 17 months out from that it's it's a really long timeline yeah it is and and the uh while all of this is going on the justice department is also taking a look at JetBlue's alliance with american which by all accounts uh is 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 um is i want to say lucrative we don't really know exactly what you know the um the details of that but uh as far as you know what it's bringing to to JetBlue's bottom line but you have to assume, and they kind of alluded to this in their earnings call, that uh, that's something that they value a lot. So absolutely, if it, you know, throughout yeah, this whole so process, they've they've been they've refused to give up the Northeast Alliance with American Airlines uh, as a concession. They've offered other things, but they adamantly refuse to give that up. So yeah, right, right, good point. And, and you just have to wonder if 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 it comes down to that, you know, if the Justice Department says, well, you gotta you gotta give up the American. Uh, relationship in order to get your spirit relationship, you know, what does JetBlue uh, choose? And and like you said, Ned, I I, I think um, they'd be uh, pretty hard pressed to uh, to surrender that that American deal. They they kind of like that a lot. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say about the JetBlue uh, Spirit deal here, it, it is a little bit unusual that uh, Spirit, if you if you just go back over the past decade or so. Spirit is the the stronger airline in terms of profitability, and uh, you know just their record of success. Um, this is just not to say JetBlue has has been you know money loser for for years. But they're just, their margins just haven't been as high, and so we do have this unique circumstance where kind of the uh, the weaker airline is buying the stronger airline. In fact, in my mind, it's almost like 
you know, so Spirit has a very, very different business model as JetBlue. You know, it's the ultra ultra low cost with a high density. You know, keep 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 low costs, uh, keep costs as you know uh, as low as possible. Uh, you know, without any kind of sacrifice. And, and um, it's you would almost think that JetBlue would want to convert the airline to that model, then vice versa. <laughs> but but it's but it's actually going from you know, you're taking the the superior business model in terms of uh, its record of profitability and converting it to the inferior one, which is a little bit unusual. Absolutely. And you, I mean, you raise a really good point on display during JetBlue's earnings in the June quarter were, you know, costs. And these have long been an issue for the airline. You know, they, they wrapped up a $300 million annual cost savings program in 2019. That was in response to their, you know, sort of poor cost control during the 2010s that of course went off the window with with covid and now they're starting a new 250 million dollar annual cost program that's supposed to end in 2024 but speaking of a merger mergers cost money and that's just on the headline you know they're buying at three three point eight billion you know integrations cost money when alaska integrated virgin america they had about 366 million dollars in merger related expenses but one thing that JetBlue faces is, you know, first of all, their unit costs are almost 50% higher than those at Spirit. And so say, figure they get some, they definitely will boost revenue with the deal, but that's a lot of, of you know, chasm uh, growth that could come out of acquiring Spirit. And it's not even including the fact that they need to retrofit all of Spirit's planes. Like you said, there are no Spirit's ultra, ultra low cost airline and people fly JetBlue, they fly JetBlue because it has, you know, Decent legroom, in-flight entertainment in every seat, like all these things that Spirit does not offer. So they've got a lot of costs coming. Yeah, they they sure do. And it's, uh, you know, I don't think anybody uh, at JetBlue is under the illusion that this is not going to be expensive. I think what they're betting on is that the uh, the, the revenues ultimately will will supersede the cost inflation. And, you know, it's it's it, it does sound like a steep hill to climb. They they may be right. I mean, I won't I won't discount it entirely. I mean, one thing they have going in their favor is that they are eliminating a very important competitor, which is uh, you know a big tailwind for for yields and RASM here. Um, and then you know just be mindful of the fact that we're in this kind of new world where it's very difficult for new startups to come in and challenge them. And the reason for that is just this you know shortage of pilots, and you know it's very hard to get. New uh, attractive positions at, at uh, you know gates at airports and things like that. So um, yeah, they're they're essentially betting that uh, you know and they won't say this, but they're essentially betting that they're you know going to just get higher revenue per passenger here. And uh, you know the way they're kind of positioning it, their argument to the Justice Department is that look, um, you know we're uh, don't think of us as eliminating spirit. Think of us as becoming a uh, more robust competitor to the big four being, you know, Delta, United, American, Southwest. Uh, right. So that, you know, the Justice Department is going to have to weigh all those arguments. Right. And one of the things that came up during JetBlue's earnings call is they see Spirit as a way to expand their, their network and sort of their, you know, their, you know, <laughs> their usefulness in markets outside of the Northeast and Florida. And JetBlue right. is historically very weak. I mean, for one, I live in Washington, D.C., and unless I'm going to Boston or Florida, JetBlue just doesn't make sense for me. And, you know, I have a city that they have a lot of flights to, but there are a lot of cities in the Midwest that, in the West, that they really just, you know, aren't, provide very little utility unless you're going to a couple key JetBlue markets. So, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of questions out there, and it's uh, it's it's in the Justice Department's hands. Yeah, I, I don't want to say that shareholder approval is, you know, in the bag, but it seems after shareholders resoundingly rejected the frontier deal that this one probably will get signed off. But yeah, it's uh, there's still a lot of uh, of um, steps to go before JetBlue Spirit's a sure thing. That's absolutely right, and uh, yeah, just the last thing I say. I mean, it does. You know, any of these mergers, uh, there's just a very, and I think we may have talked about this in a couple of podcasts ago, but just any th- these U.S. mergers, um, there's you know been five or six of them since since the America. West uh, takeover um, of U.S. Airways back in 2005 when it was in bankruptcy. I mean, there's been a you know a bunch of them since then, and they've all pretty much been successful. I mean, they've all now they they you know there have been examples of uh, deals 
where, uh, you know, you had, they, they've been followed by operational distress and, you know, maybe short-term losses. I remember, you know, most recently Alaska when they bought Virgin America in, uh, in 2015 or 16, whatever that was, um, they did, you know, they did have have some uh, some indigestion swallowing that thing. I mean, they, you know, they wound up over expanding in San Francisco, had a retreat from that. There was some fleet messiness and so. But I, I think if you ask Alaska today, I think they would tell you, um, believably, that uh, that was um, that they're glad they did it. They did it. I mean, just probably. You know what that did for their mileage program alone. You know, just being able to bring all those people from you know California into their mileage program, that probably you know delivered a, a huge benefit in terms of them. You know, being able to go to Bank of America, their partner, and saying, "Hey, look, you know, uh, you know, give us a better deal." And, and so, so JetBlue is going to get a lot of that too. You know, they're bringing all these people in from Spirit, and don't think of Spirit passengers as uh, you know. Uh, some people think, uh, oh, well, it's an ultra low cost carrier. So spirit passengers are you know, not that attractive to the credit card companies. But that's not true. If you look at like the average household income of a spirit customer, it's still pretty high. So it's, um, you know, credit card deal alone is, 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 is a, big, uh, a big part of this. And then, you know, you get scale for your network. As, as you mentioned before, Ned, you just, you know, expand geographically. And you get scale for all those travel businesses that, that uh, JetBlue is trying to develop. And you get uh, you know more more planes, more pilots, which is which is increasingly important. So I'm not, uh, you know, I'm I'm not uh, necessarily uh, negative on this deal. I think you know, despite all the cost issues and and you know some of the other demerits that we pointed out, I think this this might actually I can under I certainly understand where JetBlue is coming from. Absolutely, no, I agree, and I think you know we've we've spoken before about how. JetBlue doesn't have many growth options where it is, so this definitely gives it some expansion that that it really needs as an airline. And uh, I just wanted to say on the Alaska deal, like the Alaska Virgin America deal, like you you mentioned, like they um, Alaska became a much more relevant airline in the San Francisco Bay Area, which remains a tech hub despite all the talk of companies moving to Austin or Miami. Uh, yep, they remain a much more relevant airline, even if they did overexpand. They pulled back some, but you know, I have friends that work in tech and they didn't fly Alaska before the merger. And, and now some of them, they do not for everything, but they do for some flights. And that's that's a huge deal. But um, anyway, Jay, let's take a quick break and come back and talk about some of the, the June quarter earnings that we've heard. And we're back. Jay, you you covered a bunch of earnings last week while I was out and and I've had the chance to listen to, to JetBlue this week. What you know? What were the uh, highlights that that came out of all the calls? Yeah. So just focusing on the on the U.S. here, uh, the it, one the, one sort of takeaway is that the uh, the numbers um, in terms of just the operating margins that these airlines produced, they were all over the place. Which is not you know if you go back during most of the 2010s. There were U.S. airlines that did better than others, of course. You know, there was uh, your your star performers and your laggers. But in general, sort of the delta between the best and the worst really wasn't that high. In a, in a you know, if you, you pick a year like, I don't know, 2016, when oil prices were low, um, pretty much every U.S. airline did did well um, with it, within a reasonably narrow range. But it wasn't like that at all last quarter. So what you had is a return. Uh, to profitability for for most of the airlines, the U.S. airlines that have reported, and I should say there are a few like Spirit and Allegiant, Sun Country, which haven't yet. But as as we're doing this podcast anyway, um, but you get this just wide variety. So Southwest by far was the the sort of the superstar of the quarter, um, okay. and not terribly surprising because they had a secret weapon, <laughs> which is their 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 fuel hedges. Um, and this, you this know, is, this is when I wish we had some kind of secret weapon sound effect <laughs> drop in here and we can <laughs> stuff. But yeah, full fuel hedges. What tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and for those uh, you know who've been in the industry for for a while, you'll recall that uh, back in from like roughly 2004 to, to up running up to the financial crisis of 2008, Southwest also was the best hedged airline uh, by far. And they kind of stayed profitable while everybody else was was uh, was sort of in trouble. Most other carriers were in trouble. Well, um, it's not quite the same situation today, but but Southwest again 
has the very best hedge position by a long shot. And I'll put some numbers to that. So Frontier, completely unhedged, they paid $4.41 per gallon for their fuel last quarter, $4.41. Southwest paid three thirty six, dollars almost a dollar less per gallon. So just, just an enormous, enormous advantage there. And wow. uh, just for, yeah, and just for the uh, FYI, since we were talking about JetBlue, they paid four twenty four, dollars almost as much as Frontier. So they and and JetBlue is one of the one of just two air, two U.S. airlines that reported so far that actually posted a loss. Um, Frontier, even despite its high fuel costs, actually squeaked by with a little profit, but um, operating profit. Uh, but yeah, so so fuel prices and and the variance there, um, very big part of the story. Um, just speaking more generally, um, as you know, most listeners of the podcast will know, travel you know started coming back in a big way during the second quarter. Uh, so most of these, which is why most of these airlines, despite their higher costs, um, including fuel costs, most airlines made, made, made good money. Southwest operating margin, by the way, was 17%. So that was like better than it was pretty much doing throughout the 2010s. So it just had a really, really, really good quarter. Uh, Alaska did yeah. well as well. I mean, that's really impressive. And you know, most listeners will know many U.S. airlines dropped their fuel hedges during the 2010s, uh, particularly yep. which airline was really burned by it might have been U.S. Airways back in 2008, nine, when fuel prices dropped suddenly. And that sort of prompted the unloading of many fuel hedges. But mm -hmm. it's uh, it's interesting to see, you know, Southwest with its you know strong hedge book really profiting from it. And that's not to say that the airlines didn't have a, you know, had a bad quarter, but without fuel, it's just it, I mean, fuel was the big differ differential, it sounds like. Yep. Yeah, very much. And, and of course, uh, geography matters too. you know, for the airlines with the most Asia exposure, like United and Delta. And those two airlines did reasonably well. But that's, you know, it didn't it didn't help that they had, you know, these, you know, the exposure to China, for example, which is a larger closed market, not huge exposure, but um, but Asia in general um, was 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 a drag. Uh, and then, you know, Southwest uh, tends to do Southwest just historically, the second quarter has always been best for them. Um, whereas, you know, Alaska, it's always the third quarter. And that has to do with their, their route maps and geography and stuff. So you have to, you know, take that all into account as well. Um, but the, yeah, the last thing I said, you know, the last thing I'll say here on this is that uh, besides fuel and, you know, we've talked about the operational issues, the labor issues, there's a lot that's adding to cost. But one, um, sort of big standout uh, issue issue with costs right now with unit cost is that because most of these airlines are not able to fully utilize their assets, the demands, their planes and their people, the demand just not back to that level quite yet. So they're still, you know, picture United, they've got these triple sevens that they may have flown over to, you know, China or whatever, and they're still not optimally used because of that, you know, suboptimal utilization. That's another reason why unit costs are higher than they ultimately will be over time when 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 you know demand fully comes back and things sort of, sort of normalize. So if right. you see, we heard that we heard that with JetBlue uh, this week, you know, talking about utilization yeah. remains. They're staffed, actually, I believe they said more than they were in 2019, but they're flying less. So you you know you uh, you know efficiency is down, utilization is down. So it's uh, as that normalizes. You know, that's part of their story about bringing costs under control. Uh, that you know the costs are going to come back down, but um, they, you know, that's right. a factor of all the like the situation we've we've talked about in terms of pilots and staffing and air traffic control and all of the extraneous factors that that are sort of holding back the travel recovery to a degree. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the cardinal rules of airline industry economics is that you want to utilize your assets and your people and your aircraft, you know, your air airport gates, everything. That you want to use them as intensely as possible. But you can't uh, do that if the demand is not there or because of operational, you know, distress that's beyond your control and stuff. So that that's just not there right now. And hopefully over time, uh, you know, from the airline's perspective, that that will get better. Now, fuel, absolutely. will that get better? That nobody knows. <laughs> that's uh, that's that's I am going to have an aside here. Sorry to our listeners, but you know, speaking of the operational issues, I, I had uh, I got caught up in in Europe's operational uh, sort of air traffic control and other issues last week myself, flying on Lufthansa, and it's interesting to to see it because it's you know they've cut back capacity, they've canceled flights, but there's so little um, 
Yeah, so little, uh, what, what am I, just sort of flexibility in the system at this point that it makes you recovering from any misconnections and stuff so difficult. And that's really a challenge for airlines. So that costs airlines money. And uh, when I was at the Farm to Air show the week before, I spoke to several airline CEOs. You know, they talked about EU 261, which requires compensation if a traveler arrives at the destination more than three hours late. And, you know, there's so many costs. It just really makes it sense for an airline to pull back rather than fly passengers if they aren't able to, you know, meet the operational standards that people expect. So it's... um. You know, Lufthansa will actually report on Thursday this week, so we'll have an idea how they did um, by the time this uh, podcast drops. But it's it's interesting. Yeah, and they've situation. been dealing with labor. They've been, Lufthansa. You mentioned them. They were they're dealing with some sh- strikes, labor issues uh, on top of all the you know headaches with air traffic control and airport staffing and whatnot. Right. Absolutely. So it's a uh, it's yeah. a, it's a it's a mess out there, and that's weighing on airline utilization and and keeping those costs up even as travelers come back uh, for sure well jay yep. thank you so much for joining again this week it's always a pleasure uh and listeners you can reach jay at js at skip.com you can reach myself ned at er at skip.com thank you again for joining and have a great week thanks everyone Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out airlineweekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.